Okay, good morning. Uh, it is cloudy. The weather is cloudy today, right? Uh, but uh, I hope this afternoon it will be sunny, right? Uh, this morning we are going to read the new poem uh, by Yeats. It's called Bronze Head. The Bronze Head. And uh, it is sculpture of a, of a very uh, ugly woman. Right? Uh, but uh, she was not ugly, right? She was gorgeous when she was young. And her name is Maud Gawain. Maud Gawain. And uh, uh, she, uh, she, had, uh, she had been chasing her throughout her life. Throughout his life, Yeshi's life, uh, until the age of 52. Right? Uh, can you wait for 20, 30 years for a woman? No, right? <laughs> you will propose a few times and then give up, right? But even after he got married uh, to another woman, uh, she was thinking of her, right? And uh, <clears throat> the, the young woman, uh, Yeish was uh, 52 and uh, his wife was uh, 20, 25. You, you're laughing. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, they got two, two children, right? one daughter, one son. And uh, they had a ha happy life. But still, um, immediately after marriage, uh, he was uh, thinking of her, her Maud Gawain, and uh, her wife, George wife, pretended uh, he is uh, talking with God. And Yeish got interested in it. And he asked many questions. And that's the beginning of the uh, automatic writing. Right? And the results of the uh, automatic writings uh, were published in a book. It's called A Vision. A Vision, right? Uh, okay, uh, how much she was beautiful is described uh, in, uh, in a passage in his autobiography, and uh, part of it is quoted in my essay. We are going to read it, uh, that essay. And uh, you are interested in uh, looking at how she, she was uh, ugly, actually? Okay, I'll show you. What do you think? Not beautiful? Very beautiful. To me, she is uh, extremely beautiful. Right? Do you think so? <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> She's ugly. <laughs> right? But Yeish thought uh, she was still beautiful. Right? She wrote a poem. Right? And uh, the poem is about... Okay, thank you. The poem is about a uh, sculpture, and uh, the sculpture is this one. This one, right? And uh, the poem is really beautiful. She looks like what? A bird. What kind of bird? Hmm? What kind of bird is she? Eagle or hawk? Okay, right. Okay, uh, <clears throat> before we uh, go to the essay, uh, I'm going to give you an assignment uh, uh, for next week. Why don't you do a uh, summary? Summarize a uh, poem. Uh, it's a kind of uh, longer poem, longer than this one, Bronze Head. But it's it, it, uh, kind of short. But amazingly, uh, <coughs> This is a book, right, published by Oxford University, the most famous publisher in the world, right, Oxford University. And uh, the book, book's title is uh, The Ancient Violence, and uh, the book was uh, written by Michael Wood, a professor at Harvard, uh, Princeton University. Of course, he's retired. I was going to re uh, invite him, but uh, he's too old, I don't know. And uh, 
the whole book is about one single poem. 1919, right? Uh, amazing, right? Very beautiful book. And uh, you are going to summarize my essay. I wrote uh, an essay, and uh, it was published in an A Art and Humanist Citation Index journal. Right? So uh, I'm going to give you the uh, handout and summarize the, uh, it's a uh, longish, a little longer uh, essay. So make a summary, summarize it, and then uh, write an article about two or three pages long. First, put down your impressions, what you think of uh, the uh, poem and the, the essay. And then uh, why don't you write an essay about the poem? Because uh, we are going to read the poem today and uh, read the poem carefully and also read my essay carefully. Uh, so, and then uh, you write your own, you put down your own thoughts about the poem. So two assignments, summarize my essay and then uh, read the poem carefully. Of course, we are going to, uh, to do the cross reading of the poem, 1919. Uh, it's a political poem, political poem. Uh, uh, still, it's, it's very good uh, poem, according to him, right? It's a very good poem. And uh, you can uh, express your own uh, opinion right, in your own essay, in your essay, okay? Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's go to the poem. Uh, let's go to the essay. Uh, all of you got the uh, printout? Yes. And if you go to the syllabus, uh, there are two things, uh, two places to click. Uh, Urimar and then Youngmun. Click uh, Urim Youngmun, right? Then you can see the uh, syllabus. And uh, print out the uh, assignment, uh, assignment every day, right? So uh, you got the hand, uh, the printout with you, right? No. Do that, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, first I'd like to. Uh, begin by reading the uh, description, right? Uh, Yeats described her uh, when uh, Yeats uh, saw her for the first time. And uh, the description is very beautiful, right? Okay. Uh, Yeats said, I was 23 years old when the troubling of my life, my life began. The troubling of my life began. Meaning, uh, uh, he met her and the troubling began. I had never thought to see in a living woman so great beauty. It belonged to famous pictures, poetry, to some legendary past. Complexion, uh, like the blossom of apples, and yet face and body had the beauty of lineaments, which Blake, William Blake, Blake calls the highest beauty because it changed its list from youth to age. This is wrong, right? She changed uh, tremendously, right? And the stature, so stature so great that she seemed of a divine race. She seemed of divine, divine race. Her movements were worthy of a form, and I understood at last, at least, why the poet antiqu antiquity, where we would uh, but speak of face and form, sings loving some, some lady, but she paces like a goddess. So uh, this is the uh, description of her. I'll go, I'll, I'm going to read the uh, essay from the very beginning. Yeats and Modgon and Bronzehead. Yeats' bronze head is a poem included in his last poem, composed between 1937 and 1938. It was first published in London Mercury in March 1939, again on 22nd March 1939 
in the new republic. Actually, uh, this is one of the last points. Yeish died in 1939. I looked at the image of Maud Gaon in this poem because she is the subject in which the three dominant images are Gaon, human, superhuman, and supernatural, with a bird, the round eye. The poem originated from a work of sculpture in the Municipal Gallery of Modern Art Dublin by a sculptor, Lawrence Campbell. This poem is an occasion for Yeish to contemplate the long involvement with the woman he had given all as lover and poet. This is one of the last poems about Gone. Probably we could understand how her images have changed over time, can bring the full circle into a form of non-substance of the woman Yeish has long loved. The poem sees two of Yeish's last images gone, resulting from his lifelong relation with her. Uh, for Yeish, talking about what he's feeling and contemplating in his last years, the poem is unique in the whole body of his poetry. And I disagree with Ransom, who viewed this poem when it's published in Last Poems and Plays, that it is inferior to other poems. Uh, Ransom is a very famous uh, critic and scholar, and he, he thinks it's a bad poem, but I don't agree. I think it is one of the greatest short poems, if not the best poem in his last years. My essay studies images relevant to these poems, to these poems both real and imagined, to understand the poem in a proper perspective. It is to collate what's flowed in both Yeats and Gon's heart and mind. It studied the poem and other relevant works by Yeish. Yeish wrote the Bronze Head in his last years between 1937 and 1938. He died in 1939. The speaker in the poem speculates upon the images in an effort to grasp what the real substance of Maud Gone is. In the poem, the speaker Yeish, looking on the bronze statue of Maud, is overwhelmed with emotions for the woman he has seen so near and loved with all his might, with all his heart and mind. He has, however, never fully won a heart till now. The poem is brimming over with feelings of great power and sincerity. The poem's third stanza sums up what has happened so far since he met her. Though they were different, they have been too close to each other, uh, for example. But even at the staring post, all sleek and new, I saw the wildness in her, and I thought a vision of terror that it must leap through had shattered her soul, propinquity had brought imagination to that pitch where it cast out all that is not itself. I had grown old, I, I had grown wild and wandered, murmuring everywhere, my child, my child. Reading the poem, reading between the lines in it, working back, uh, looking back on some past relationship between them, we can come to find Yeichis and most life have been woven. Let's begin with stanza one. Here at right of the entrance, this bones had the human, superhuman, a burst brown dye, everything else withered and mommy dead. What great uh, tomb, tomb haunter sweeps the distant sky Something may linger there, though all else die, and finds there nothing to make his terror less, his terrica pasio of his own emptiness. The poem begins with the present. In his late life, months before he died in 1939, in the poem, the speaker speaks to himself in contemplation in face of a bust of a woman cast in bronze, mod gone. She is human, superhuman, as she has been, yet, she looks withered, mommy dead, except the bird's round eye. Terrified by all this, all that was beautiful in her is gone. He cannot believe that she is now something that may linger here through all else die, but the fact is she is now the great tomb haunter, haunter. Say a bird, an eagle that sweeps the distant sky, the tomb haunter looks like searching for something but finds nothing but the emptiness of the tomb. If something were found there, it would make its emptiness less hysterical pasio. Gon's eagle eye is no longer useful now. It's for nothing. It, 
Has he ever been emblematic of the great cause for Ireland? And was her glory gone? Actually, uh, she, is, she has been fighting for Ireland. She was an a independence fi fighter, right? Ireland is still divided, right? The northern part is what? It belonged to uh, the UK, right? To Yeish, the bronze head is a shocking thing at first sight. He is absolutely nonplushed, tongue-tied. The poetic diction itself imitates his reaction. Just words, images, ideas enumerated, which form no sentence, that is to say, form imitate substance in this poem. When you confront a thing you have never expected or never thought it would happen in reality, the reaction is you will be speechless, dumbfounded, speechless. This is what the first three lines are. This is uh, also found elsewhere in Lee Swan, another masterpiece poem, very, uh, which is the best, the best of best, and also in the one final, one, final one-act masterpiece, Purgatory, is a, is a play, one-act play. And Lida Swan, Lida is violently ravished by the Godhead in the form of Swan. Never could Lida imagine such a thing should ever happen to her. Thus, the poem is begun with a sudden blow. Lida looks as if she is struck with a thunderbolt. So, look. What is taking place in the four lines after the southern blow? The swan's very violent ravishing of this struggling leader. Okay, this is the beginning of leader and swan. A southern blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs grasped by the dark webs, her nape caught in his bill, he holds a helpless breast upon his breast. A southern blow is the first thing in the first stanza's first line. It is the summation of the whole point. A southern blow, it is to the defenseless, innocent girl bathing. How could you change the diction without losing its intensity? Not only that, the reader is bombarded with blows after blows of the shocking in the next three lines, the synecdochic image of the god ravishing the girl. The great wings beating still and above the staggering girl and the thighs crashed and by the, la by the webs and the nape caught in his bill. And then the full sentence. It stands still and firm, sustaining all these synecdoches. The form here exactly depicts the brutal and the violent in the annunciation of a new civilization, civilization through the image of uh, through, through an image of Lee, whose breast helplessly up, upholding the other beast of God. It is a masterstroke indeed. Let us go to another example of this practice. Yeats's last play, Purgatory, begins lightheartedly with the boy innocent and full of complaints to the old man, he accompanies with a heavy load of pack. Actually, uh, the old man is, is uh, his father. The play begins with a boy. Half door, ha hold door, he and the third day and night, heel and hollow, shouldering his, uh, this pack, hearing you talk. The boy wonders why they should be wondering day and night, shouldering a heavy pack. And during hearing his endless talk, the boy's complaining powers up, up and up until his hearing you uh, until his hearing you talk. Each word pause and pause with the alliterative sound H, half door, hither and dither, hill and hollow. This hearing, the sound such as. Uh, he, hi, this, and things like that are expressive of the grumbling of the boy. Half door must be one of the doors of the room they have slept in. Whole door must be another door of another house they have stayed in. They travel here and there as peddlers. They walk day and night, sometimes climb up the hill, down the vale, crossing the river. The boy carries a heavy pack filled with money on his shoulder. The boy has to hear the old man talk and talk. He can understand not a single word of it, not even until he was stabbed to death by the old man, his own father, with an old jackknife he had killed his own father with. Terrible, right? He killed two people. Uh, with a knife the old man has ever since eaten it and again is to kill his own son. Very strange play, right? Note that this beginning sentence is headless, no subject. The one that shoulders 
this pack, and here's your talk, is the boy. The fact that the opening talk is without the subject presages what is to come in the, in the play. The beheading, in the old man's view of family blood, of the evil cycle of bad blood from granddad to the old man, to the boy. To the old man, the fact of uh, the, the act of murdering is an act of purifying old man's mother's soul, an act of mercy, putting down to evil that is to continue through the boy, his son. Now, let us study the image of Morgan as depicted in the poem and define the human and the superhuman and the supernatural in her, which is the true substance of her. Now, the first image of Morgan, the human in her. To Yeats, Morgan must have been the super, superhuman from the very beginning, as, as described in the autobiography, book one, four, four years. Yeats recently moved from Dublin. At the end of the 80s, my father and mother, my brother and sister and myself, all newly arrived from Dublin, were settled in Bedford, uh, Bedford Park in a red brick house with several mental pieces of wood copied from marble uh, uh, metal mental pieces designed by the brothers Adam, a balcony and a little garden shadowed by a great horse chestnut tree. One day on 13th January 1889, a handsome drove up to their door at Bedford Park with Miss Maud Gone. She's go he is going to meet, meet, meet her, who brought an introduction to his father from old John Leary, the Fenian leader. Yeats met her for the first time, and she looked, she looked like a goddess. Uh, in that day, she seemed the classical impersonation of the spring, the Virgilian commendation. She works like a goddess, made from her a, from a own. Her complexion was luminous, like that of apple blossoms, through which the light falls. And, and I remember her standing that first day by a great heap of such blossoms in the window. Uh, okay, I'll skip. Next quote. Okay, in the middle. Not only Yeats, but all his family seemed impressed with her. On that day, his father and all his children Yeats, Lily, Lolly, 16-year-old Jack, were in the sitting room to greet her. Along with Yeats, his brother and his two sisters looked up at Mo Modgon as if she were indeed a visitor from some other world. Yeats's younger sister, Lolly, wrote about Modgon. Uh, Miss Gone, the Dublin beauty who is marching on to glo glory over the hearts of the Dublin youth, called today on Willie. William H., of course, but also apparently on Papa. She is immensely tall and very stylish, well dressed in careless way. She came in a handsome, handsome carriage, right? Cap all the way from Belgravia and kept the handsome waiting while she was here. Lily noticed that she was in her slippers. She has a rich complexion and hazel eyes, and is, I think, decidedly handsome. I could not see her well as her face was turned from me. Yeats with Maud Gaughan's home two days later on February 1st and wrote a letter about her to John O'Leary. I dined with her last night. She is not only very handsome, but very clever, though her politics in European matters be a, a little sensational. She was fully persuaded that Bismarck had poisoned or got murdered the Austrian king or a prince or what was it who died the other day. It was present, however, to hear her attacking a young military man from India who was there on English rule in India. She is very Irish, a kind of Diana of Crossways. Her pet monkey was making much of time little melancholy cries on the hearthrug, the monkeys are degenerate men, not men's ancestors. Here, hence, their sadness and the look of boredom and old age, there were also two young pigeons in the cage whom I mistook for sparrows. It was you, was it not, who converted the Gone to an Irish opinion. She herself will make many uh, converts. On the other hand, Maud Gone had never been to London's uh, Bohemia, though 
She had met all kinds of people, from princes to Trinity students. She was a candidate princes, and rebel, generals, and conspirators, and with the intellectual continental salons. In Dublin, she moved among home rulers, separatists, Trinity students. Bethel Falk was her first introduction to London's Bohemia. As a friend of Jack B. Rage, uh, Yates' father, J.B. Yates described it. Many artists, writers, teachers lived there. Few of them were well off and some were poor, but there was no lack of good-looking children, perhaps Im imprudently begotten, uh, to be seen about, about the about road. There was a talking society called Calamar, uh, much favored by age, where all things were discussed in the free spirit. His own house was a great running point, a transplanted slip of old island. Yeats has, since then, wrote so much about Maud Gone, more than 30 poems, either in part or in whole, about her. 30 poems. Could you do that? Right? The Bronze Head is the last major poem exclusively about her, except for the first book of poetry, Crossways. 18, uh, his first book of uh, poetry was published in 1889. This is the first book. Almost all the books have poems about Gone. The Rose in the Seven Woods have the most poems about her. The first book was, has five more gone poems, such as To the Rose Upon the Road of a Time, The Rose of the Word, The Sorrow of Love, The Countess Castle in Paradise, and To Ireland in Coming Time. The second book of his poetry has a total of 13 poems in it. And six are about Mot Gone, such as The Arrow, The Folly of Being Comforted, Never Give All the Heart, Adam's Curse, Red Hanlon's Song About Ireland, Oh, Do Not Love Too Long. However, even after these books, Yeats kept writing on her, and in fact, in all of his books of poetry, there tend to be good poems about Mot Gone, except in Full Moon in March, most of which is highly uh, uh, philosophical poetry. The moment Yeats met her for the first time in 1889, he instinctively sensed that Maud Gaunt's beauty is more than human. Even in his early poems, as in The Rose and in Seven O's, Yeats not only sings of love on a personal level, he also reaches higher for a superhuman realm. This dual aspect in his poetry is exemplified in one of his earliest poems, such as The Sorrow of Love. This is a good poem a poem that deals with a person in love with a girl whose love is probably beyond his reach and who is defined, uh, destined to, to be another Helen. Helen, right? Uh, this is the poem. The brawling of a sparrow in, in the eaves, the brilliant moon and all the Milky Way, all that famous harmony of leaves had blotted out man's images and cried. A girl arose that had red mournful lips and seemed the greatness of the world in tears, doomed like Odysseus. The laboring ships and proud as a priming, muttered with his peers, rose and on the instant clamorous wings, a climbing moon upon an empty sky, and all that lamentation of leaves could but compose man's cry, man's image and his cry. In this poem, the girl is contrasted with the man, and the girl is more gone on, on a personal level, clearly, but the man impersonated by Yeats is not there from the very beginning. He is there as an emotion, only through an in, indirect metaphor. The sparrow as Yeats and his brawling is blotted out by the brilliant moon and the milky sky and the, all the harmony of leaves. A sparrow is part of nature, just as man's image and his cry are part of nature. The first lines, the brawling of sparrow seems to be to best depict the uh, speaker's love toward the girl. However, in an instant, it proves to be wrong. It is merely part of nature, like the moon and the sky and the leaves, because these blotted out man's image and cry. And the third and last stanza is a confirmation of man's status in the grand cycle of history. And it is to confirm what will happen to Yeshin Motgong. To add up further touches toward a round figure of Gon and Yeats's work, the second stanza matters a lot. The second stanza reiterates the short, the story of mankind, Helen and the Great War, hinting at, at 
gone as a modern Helen in, this, in Irish history. The girl is described, if you disregard the exact grammar in the stanza and uh, read him impression, impressionistically, which is sometimes a fruitful reading, as one who had read mournful lips seemed in tears, doomed like Odysseus, and the laboring ship, and was proud as a prime, watered with spears, as in all some of his early poems that have much foresight of what would come many years later. So is this poem of prediction of what will come between Yeish and Gaul. What had happened to Helen is to happen to Maud and to Yeish from this moment on. All those things look eerie, real, with those graphic words, red mournful lips, tears, doomed, proud, murdered. Now let's go, uh, go to the image of the supernatural in Maud Gaul. As in the image of human and superhuman, it's not easy to make distinction between what's human and what's beyond the human in mode. To Yeish, she must have been wild from the very beginning of their friendship, all through the long-lasting love-hate relationship. Yeish, when writing this, his bronze head, thought Modgon is something more than human. Stanza three states both the first impression on her and what they had undergone since they first met. But even at the starting point, all sleek and new, I saw the wildness in her and thought a vision of terror that they must live through had shattered at all. Propinquity had brought imagination to that pitch where it cast out all that is not itself. I had grown wild and wandered murmuring everywhere. My child, my child. She had wildness in her from the very beginning Though she was all sleek and new, now that she is looking back, she, she realized that the soul had to live through a vision of terror that had shattered it, but the, their kinship had been so close, which helped imagination extend so much that nothing but imagination remains like her. He had grown wild and wandered everywhere, saying that wild imagination is his as well as hers. In lines four to six in this stanza, Yeish uses Latinity, Latin words, for a poetic purpose. Propinquity had brought imagination to the pitch where it cast out all that is not itself. In these, he uses the cacophonic, ugly sound, cacophonic P and an intrusive T sound to imitate the relationship between mode and yes. In propinquity and in the pitch, P gets stressed and emphasis in meaning and pronunciation. It is very good at choosing what fits well in the poem, including Latin words. Bodgon was also visionally, although her minds were full of Irish problems, she believed in the mystical power. She believed in all the gods, Christian and pagan. After coming back from fundraising in America in winter 1897 to 98, she went on a mystical quest with Willie. According to Yeish's letter to George Russell, dated uh, London, 22nd January 1898, Yeish and Modgon went away for a week or two perhaps to some country, where, country place in Ireland to get, as you, as you do, the forms of gods and spirits and uh, to get sacred earth for our vacation. Modgon has seen a vision of little temple of the heroes which she proposes to build somewhere in Ireland when 98 is over and make the center of our mystical and literary movement. As Modgon Maud had been in constant touch with him and was alive, Yeish did not include her in his poem, All Souls Night. Uh, All Souls Night is a great poem, the last concluding poem uh, uh, in vision, in vision, a vision, right? The concluding uh, old night's uh, soul, old night, old salt night, the concluding poem to his great lifelong achievement, a vision. If she had been dead, she uh, she could put her in it. Yeish wrote old salt, old salt night in November 1920, and put it in his earlier version of a vision, published in 1925. But in this book, the poem is one part of the three parts in book. For the gate to Pluto, however, Yeats gave more weight to the important poem as a concluding poem to the whole book of A Vision, published in 1938, with its final revisions. 
While Yeats was rewriting his final vision, his bronze head was composed and soon published. In All Souls Night, Yeats calls up each of his death friends, Horton, Florent, Emery, MacGregor Mathers, the three ghosts, and offers two long glasses brimmed with muscatel, bubble on the table. They will drink from the wine brass while our gross palace drink from the whole wine. The ghost has fine element sharpened by death. On first glancing at Modgon, Yeishton must have seen something in her that is beyond the human as he has conjured up the Virgilian commendation, she works like goddess. She must have so fine element that is the realm of the otherworldly already. When they met for the first time, Yeats immediately fell in love with Modgon and wrote a play specifically for her, The Countess Catherine. The first version published in 1892, revised continually as the play had been performed. This was Yeats' first play, a play that deals with the problem soul. It seemed to him to be unsatisfactory. It was dedicated to Modgon. How the play, The Count of Kathleen, was conceived and how important it was to Yeats was recorded in his unpublished autobiography. Okay, I'll skip the uh, quotation. Uh, next, Yeats, uh, in his letter, wrote about the first publication of the book, Counted Kathleen. Okay, I'll skip. Okay, page, um, let's jump to page 294, the first paragraph. Based on what Yeats said as above, we can see that the play had been intended for Maud Gone, and that she actually played the part of Kathleen in the performance of the play, but it is interesting to see Yeish's dedication to Maud Gone changed in each version and publication of the play. He uh, uh, dedicated this uh, play to Maud Gone, and then uh, he removed it later on. Right? I don't know why. <laughs> okay. I'll go to uh, section 5 on page 295. In the poem, the bone's head, in addition to the image of human, superhuman, Yeats, Yeats's concluding image of Modgon is supernatural, supernatural. Whereas the image of uh, superhuman seems to be concerned with Modgon, her soul, her beliefs in the mythology and mysticism, her Christian ideas, her political matters in relation with Ireland in opposition to England. Supernatural posit the image between the human realm of Modgon and the Super, uh, superhuman realm that embraces things beyond the human, as is exhibited in the poem itself. In the poem's beginning, when the speaker asks if there is substance in the, po in the woman, she is asking himself the same question as well. Anyone, including MacTaggart, could reach the profound truth that you cannot say there is substance or non substance in her. She is in part human, she is in part supernatural. In this point, Yeats has two things balanced, yet at first sight it seems that one is heavier than the other. The civilization either declines or rises. On the face, it seems like the poem depicts the degenerating states of Ireland and England. As Stanfield concludes that the last stanza of the poem is perhaps the plainest evocation of degeneration anywhere in the Yeats' play by quoting the whole stanza. He is right to point to the degenerating images of things. But the fact is, however, he is slighting the fine balance. Yeats underlies in, in the poem, uh, okay? The quote regarding, uh, this is what uh, Yeats said. Regarding this poem, there is another reading, which is rather too round to stop. He said, okay, I'll skip. Okay. We need to go back to the whole poem structure to get uh, what it feels like when uh, Yeats plays on the high ropes. Stanza one, line two has three words enumerated, human, superhuman, a bird's round eye. The next line says, the everything, everything else we heard, mommy, dad. What does it mean? She is not dead. She is human, a superhuman, a bird's round eye. The past mode and the present mode are contrapuntal, contrapuntal. Stanza two, line one says, no dark tomb haunter once, which is to mean that she is now a dark tomb haunter, but still without 
magnanimity of light. Furthermore, she is a most gentle woman. This is to counterpoint the dark. The light and dark are counterpuntal, past and present counterpuntal. Stanza three. Her having been all sleek and new and having been a vision of terror, she and I are counterpuntal. Stanza four. This consists of two counterpoints. One is she is supernatural, the other is she is what she is, borrowing for some time a supernatural eye. Yeats must, of course, have thought Morgan was supernatural, but the fact it was, she wasn't. She was just as he believes in the souls of his friend as in All Souls Night. But as in the poem's claim, the element in humans is sharpened and transcends the human realm. And it is safe to Yeats is talking the present and the future as well as the past in this poem. So in this poem, the second point repeats instances of history and laws of nature and increases its intensity to the extent of posing the indirect question hanging in the air. The sterner eye wondered what was left for massacre to save. The speaker almost identifies with Mordgon's position by agreeing, it seems, to what she has done is what ought to be done. What else could she do in face of the whole history of humanity? The speaker and Maud are counterpuntal, past and future counterpuntal in the face of the universe. Or else I thought her supernatural as though sterner eye looked through her eye. On this final world, in the decline and fall, on gangling stocks grown great, the gray stocks run dry, ancestral pearls all pitched into a scotch tie, heroic reverie marked by clown and knave wondered what was left for massacre to save. The essence of humanity is the essence of supernatural. Everything cycles. Eventually, the human is freed, like the soul, from the confines of body, as the scent that lingers in the heart of a lily as another great man of wisdom observes. Uh, let us grasp the essence of what our species has been and still is beyond thought and beneath society. An essence that may be vouchsafed to us in a mineral more beautiful than any work of man, in the sense more subtly evolved than our books that lingers in the heart of a lily, in the wink of an eye, heavy with patience, serenity, mutual forgiveness, that sometimes through an involuntary understanding one can exchange with a cat, Levi Strauss, a great man, he died just, uh, a few years ago. In the poem's case, the eye is comprehensive, human, superhuman, supernatural. The eyes both moles and third eye by way of her. Her gaze is the gaze of an eagle, a cat, a goldfish, a bird of human a superhuman, of a thing of mineral, living or living. The poem of bronze head is a gaze on Modgon and on non-Modgon. Modgon herself, being a gaze, is a supernatural being. The ever-expanding universe of truth as well. A bronze has a piece of jam cut out of such an extraordinary vision of a woman called Modgon. Okay, thank you. We'll take a 10-minute break.